going on, people? Welcome to a brand new edition of the podcast. It's been a while, but we're back with another amazing guest and episode today. We today we're here with conductor, music director, and pianist Luke Fraser. How are you, sir? You okay? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. How's things okay? Oh, it's wonderful. Just keeping pretty busy, doing a ton of projects in all different directions, but that's how I like to live. Exactly. I mean, are you I I can't you on tour at the moment or did the tour recently? The tour recently ended, actually. We were we were touring elementary schools for free. That's one of the great things I love to do. I grew up in a very rural area, and so whenever I can, I like to go back with free tours for kids. That's absolutely amazing. Cause I remember you actually saying him how much you think the, the public music education system. I mean, for you to actually help out and do something like this is amazing. I mean, do you go around, around the whole country doing this? Honestly, the best part about it is COVID actually helped us. We always went on week-long tours, and now we're doing three weeks a year of live tours, completely for free in very rural, underserved schools. But the best part about COVID is it it gave us the technology to really improve our streaming capability. And would you believe now we're in all 50 states of the United States? And just wow. this past week when we were on tour, we got to connect in real time with over 100,000 students. Wow. I mean, that's incredible. 100,000 students. We are very proud of that number. And again, it's something we keep trying to raise the bar and get to even more kids because they deserve it. They deserve all the chances that any kid deserves. Of course they do. I mean, you, you said about your, your streaming capabilities. I mean, what kind of things do you do with streaming then? Do you do you like live performances, workshops? How does it work? In, in that Honestly, we do all of... We do all of the above. So for our touring, what we do is we take a show written by a Broadway writer and we make a miniature musical for kids that showcases all kinds of great music. We teach them about instruments in the orchestra. We teach them about what it's like to be a performer. And so we share these shows with the kids. We talk to them in real time. They get to ask questions in real time. And then for older kids, you know, high school, college age, we do all kinds of free master classes with Broadway singers and instrumentalists and everyone in the business that they might be able to get to know. It's so much fun. I bet. I mean, was that the, always the original plan to do something like this or did it come out because of what, because of COVID? Well, you know, it's been part of who we are. The orchestra has been around the American Pops for eight years. And from day one, we wanted to make sure that education and free educational access was central to who we were. But COVID kind of supercharged it. We were able to reach so many more people in a way that we never would have thought of, as so many people have in the arts industry. I bet. I mean, was it quite difficult to put together or was it such a natural thing for you to do? How, how did it all come, you know, come out? Well, you know, it was so natural because we have an excellent videographer on our team. We have a great audio crew on our team. And so we've got a collection of great directors that are able to help us from time to time with theater and television experience. And so it was something that evolved and we grow and we learn and we try to do better every time. For me, that's kind of the story of life is how can I wake up the next day and do a little better than I did before? Exactly. But I absolutely love that. I'm, I'm so with you on that side of the whole music section of the education because if it wasn't for music for me, I don't know where the hell I'd be in my life. So, yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> but to thank you, thank you for doing such an amazing thing with with your talent, your time. Because I know how busy you are, and mm -hmm. to, to tour with it as well, all all over fifty states as well. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, how do you fit that into your schedule? You must be so busy at the moment. Well, it is pretty crazy. You know, next week I'll be in New York. I'll be in Florida. I'll be back to Washington D.C. All in one week, all different concerts. And so what's wonderful is I get that variety, though. You know, for me, I kind of figure while I'm young-ish, <laughs> I might as well use the energy while I still have it and, and go to as many places and share what I love with as many people as I can. Of course. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. I mean, would you ever take it to, say, Europe as well or outside of America at some point? Or are you focused on the U.S. at the moment? Well, you know, too late is what I would say, because <laughs> actually just this past this past July 4th, we were the guests of the U.S. ambassador to Portugal, and we did a full concert at the embassy in Lisbon. And then actually this June, we're headed to Panama to perform for the U.S. ambassador. And of course, lots of folks are going to be traveling around Panama performing all sorts of concerts. So believe you me, we are we are open to coming any place and I'm open because, again, the great thing is, is no matter where you're from, no matter what you believe, no matter what language you speak, music is that great connector. So for me, I uh, have baton, will travel. <laughs> I love that saying. I love that. I mean, how, how do you find touring in general? Do you find it really, really fun to do? Do you find it really hard? Because I, I know you've been in the, in the industry for quite a while now. And I know through my podcast, I've had the chance to talk to a lot of amazing people within the industry. And it's kind of like a love-hate thing, isn't it? Where 
obviously the performance side of things they absolutely love it obviously but then they kind of the admin the organization the traveling as you know so well is can be a nightmare sometimes mm-hmm. i mean for you personally how do you find touring whether it's the, the education system or just yeah. performing in general how do you find it you know when i'm traveling to schools it's it's so rejuvenating it's exhausting mm-hmm. because you're giving everything you have in every single performance as are the actors and the musicians mm-hmm. But I will tell you, it's so inspiring and it's so energizing that it takes me days to kind of come down after I get home. And for my professional touring, when we're doing, you know, televised projects, as I'll be doing again next week, um, it's something that's totally different because it's a high pressure situation. You have very little time to get it right. And you're in a theater or a city you've never been. And you just the, the best part I've learned is to build the tribe of people around you that you trust and you love to work with and that all are in it for the right reasons and the same reason to advance this mission. And yes, it's difficult. I will tell you selfishly, one of the most difficult things is being away from my two dogs that I love so much. Yeah. <laughs> they don't travel with me. So they. it's always great to get home and, and reunite it with my two girls. Oh, fair. What, what, what breeds do you have at the moment? I have two Shih Tzu. They're oh, the best. No. I've had a lot of dogs, and Shih Tzu are my favorite. Oh, I love that. I know that with touring as well, obviously every project is completely different, obviously. How on, on average, how long do you kind of get to prep for each tour that you do, whether it's a performance one, an education one? How long do you roughly get for each tour? Honestly, it's completely different each time. One of the things I pride myself in is adaptability and versatility and being able to do that quickly. And again, that's the kind of group of people I surround myself with, the musicians, the crew, people that can turn on a dime and shift what we're doing. And that's why next week is a great example. Three different cities, three different concerts. But I trust all the people I'm with. I love all the people I'm with. And um, and some prep, some of these shows I've done before, but two of them I've never done before. So it's great to to keep myself on my toes whenever I can. I bet. I mean... In that instance, then, what have been some of the best lessons that you've learned in terms of getting prepared for these tours, whether it's organizational skills or, like I said, trusting the right sort of people around you? What have been some of the best lessons that you've learned in terms of making sure that every performance you do is of the highest standard? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, as you said, and, and I had said earlier, it's finding the right people around you to work with that you trust and understand mm-hmm. what you're going for. You know, the thing about conductors is we all have a different focus and we all have a different vision for what we want to do with our music and for me it's getting the right people around me that aren't trying to fit me into a mold of trying to be someone else that are that are taking what I offer and what I want to offer and how I want to change our industry and they're supporting that mission and vision and working alongside that and simultaneously it's knowing my music so well inside and out that I could do it you know, underwater, blindfolded, upside down. (laughs) And that's kind of the way I approach it is so prepared that when I actually get to the concert or the performance, it's just I'm able to have fun and and also be reactive in real time to how things change because every concert's different, even if it's the same show. Exactly. I couldn't couldn't agree more. And I know that obviously I've I've covered in the industry as well. A lot of things can go wrong behind the scenes, which not everyone knows about, obviously. I mean... (laughs) For yourself, have there been any kind of nightmare moments you've had to deal with, kind of like behind the scenes, last minute, or at any point in general? Well, honestly, I can say it wasn't even behind the scenes. It was on a very famous, I won't tell you the name of the venue, but a very famous American concert hall. And this was just about three, four months ago. Um, I got to the very last piece of the show. It was being filmed for television. And we get to the last piece and it's this iconic performer and comes out on stage and collapses on the stage in her second of four songs that she was doing. I'm facing upstage or excuse me, facing downstage. And um, and all of a sudden I hear this noise behind me and it's a full concert hall. And this person had had hip surgery and the hip came out. Wow. I know. And so. Uh, at that moment, I kept the orchestra playing. I got off the podium. This is in front of an entire sold out audience. I'm an Eagle Scout, by the way. <laughs> so got off the podium to see what I could do to help this woman. And luckily, she was okay in the end. But it was it was a matter of to, you know, as the Brits say the best, keep calm and carry on. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those situations is I knew this wasn't life threatening. I knew she was going to be okay, but I knew we had to take care of her immediately. But also, I had to keep the music going so the whole audience didn't become a sea of panic and so that's exactly what happened and it was 
it's those split second moments when you when you realize the show must go on always exactly i i don't know what i would do in that same situation though because i've had obviously a few things happen obviously over the years but nothing to that standard though so you yeah. see like being an Eagles the, <laughs> well one concert i was doing too was an outdoor concert years ago and it was it was a storm but it wasn't that bad and we were out in this pavilion and all of a sudden all the power went off on stage and the orchestra kept playing through the darkness and the power eventually came back on but it was that was another one that it's raining and blowing and lightning and <laughs> and the show went on. It went yeah. on. Imagine because because I remember when I did a festival a few years ago, which almost got cancelled because of the wind. I mean, has that ever happened to you over the years? Where because it's been like a power cut or some weather problems that had to cancel it last second. Honestly, the only one was that time when the power went out. Most of the time, I've been lucky to dodge things by a day or two it seems that whether it's a hurricane or or whatever is coming through i've managed to avoid it thank goodness so thank God, thank fingers God, crossed fingers crossed for sure but i i, I won't obviously mention the name of the concert that happened recently because i don't want to obviously say names just in case but yeah. when it comes to doing a big performance say for a major name and you've got to get the, get, get the rights for performance how does that kind of work in terms of getting the right to performance and so forth, because it must be so difficult to sort that out in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, for instance, I did a tribute to Ella Fitzgerald. Mm. And for many iconic performers like that, it's building a relationship with their foundation and state and letting them know that you're going to honor their music and represent it to the best of your ability. I also did the same thing when I did the concert version of Wicked for PBS and working with Stephen Schwartz, the composer of that piece, who actually let me reorchestrate the entire, have it reorchestrated the entire piece. And so letting them know my perspective and why I want to do these things with them and being in lockstep with them the entire way. So it's building that trust and then having a track record of quality and success and knowing that if they're going to give me the honor of getting to perform their music, that they know it's going to be in very careful, thoughtful hands. I bet. Carl, I, I wanted to actually mention about the Ellen Fitzgerald, but I wasn't too sure if it was the situation where the fainting yeah. happens. I didn't want to mention just in case. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. That was a different one. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. I've seen that like, uh, quite recently, actually. It was about a few months back you did that. Yeah. yeah oh, was... that's been a while back. That's been oh, a while okay. back. But but um, we've been filming so many more, and I've got my next one I'm filming actually this week. For PBS, which is a show called Broadway's Brightest Lights, and it's a celebration of all kinds of Broadway music from many different eras with a with a really great cast. That's amazing, and you, you led me perfectly onto my next kind of questions. Actually, as well is, yeah, I see they've done, done a lot of work actually with PBS. How did that relationship form in the first place? Did you reach out to them? Did they see your work and reach out to you. How did that kind of relationship work in the first place? It was a mutual relationship in that I had been. I had been conducting for a show on PBS for the last four or five years and it had gone well and our ratings were good. But then during COVID, I realized many orchestras were just stopping performing or doing only remote or doing, you know, they wouldn't get an ensemble together. But after doing extensive research and talking to a lot of medical professionals, we realized that we could film safely outdoors spaced. And we did this, by the way, in August of 2020. This is far ahead of, of many organizations even trying that. And PBS got word that we were doing these things. And in fact, Ella was one of those first ones we filmed. And believe it or not, um, that led to now we've had 17 shows on PBS. So this next one, it will be number 18. And then in August, I'll be filming number 19. And um, September, probably September will be number 20. So it just keeps rolling along. And the thing for me is that every single one of these shows for PBS has been different. And I think what brings me such joy with such a commitment to rural America and areas that don't have as many arts organizations, this is a tremendous way to reach audiences that don't get the chance to see as much live performance and to do it for free. And with PBS, I've been very mindful and careful to make sure that we are representing the broadest cross-section of our world in our performers and in our music. I really admire that, that's fantastic. And when you're working with such a major network such as PBS, is it exciting for you? Is it nerve-wracking? Is it really stressful? How do you feel kind of behind the scenes when working with such a major network like that? Well, I love it. You know, for me, it's it's only stressful in that each time I try to raise the bar for myself. Mm. How can I how can I make it more interesting, more engaging, reach more people? 
And so that's the only stressful component. As far as creating the shows, there's so much work that goes into it and it's very quick always. And of course, I'm, I'm raising funds to help make those projects happen. And so there's so many pieces that go into it beyond just studying the music or working with the artists, but I love it. It's so much fun. And it's an honor to get to be on a network that I've loved since I was a kid. Of course, that is absolutely amazing. And talk about the, the quick work that you do. I mean, mm-hmm. what's been the quickest kind of thing that you've had to put together for any kind of show that you've done? Was it like a couple of days, or a week, couple of weeks? How, what's the quickest kind of thing oh. that you've done? <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, much faster than that. I will tell you that I've had, you know, I was once putting together a program for an American president. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was doing a concert and I had only one rehearsal period wow. in the concert hall before the concert happened. So that level of pressure I'm getting kind of used to. You have to do things quickly at a very high level. I was working with celebrities at the time, so that made it a little more helpful. But even them, you know, it's just kind of that unspoken rule that this is going to be quick and and we're going to do what we do. Yeah. I bet you don't have time to think much when you're doing it so quickly, do you? <laughs> just on the music and the success of the product and everything else has to go out the window at that point. But exactly. I love that. <laughs> I bet, I bet. And talk about presidents as well, actually, you performed at uh, Mount Vernon for George Washington's mm-hmm. place. How, how, what was that like for you? That was fantastic. I love history mm-hmm. and um, and world history, American history. That's what I read most when I'm not studying music. Mm-hmm. And to get to perform it at Mount Vernon and film for PBS was something truly incredible. And not only talking about American history, but talking about um so many things that we need to write in American history and so many issues that need to be addressed head on and acknowledged and and honor the past of these people who gave so many, the the many slaves who lived at Mount Vernon and that community who lived in oppression under this man. So we did an entire segment with the incredible mezzo-soprano Denise Graves talking about the important history we have to face and we have to acknowledge and we have to honor the past of these people who gave so much for so many other people against their will. And we wanted to make sure that wherever we film, we are doing the work to honor those communities who haven't had their voices heard in the past. Mm, I, I really admire that. Kind of like you, I love history as well so much. I think it's incredible, absolutely incredible. And earlier you mentioned about Broadway shows as well, such as Wicked mm-hmm. in Concert. I mean, what's that like working on Broadway shows? Well, that's really exciting. And, and the great thing with that is taking a Broadway show that so many people know and love and flipping it on its head, doing new arrangements, new versions, having people that have never performed the show do the show. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite things. And so we're getting ready to do another iconic musical. I can't tell you yet, (laughs) Um, but follow us at the American Pops and you will (laughs) see very soon this next big Broadway blockbuster reimagined. Perfect. And again, that's a perfect segue into the next section actually now as well. Yeah. I would love to find out more about your role as obviously founder and musical founder for APO, American Pop Orchestra. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier, we started back in 2015. I mean, how does it all begin for you in the first place? How did it all start? Well, you know, it's no mystery to many orchestra lovers out there or people observing the orchestral mm-hmm. world that it's been a struggle for many years. Audiences have been consistently declining across the industry as a whole. Funding has been a struggle. And for me, that's really what what created my desire to create this group that did it a different way. We do, even though the name Pops is in the name of it, we do a lot of classical music and we play for some of the most famous classical artists in the world, Joshua Bell, Midori, Jean Thibaudet, Rene Fleming, we've worked with all of them and many more. Um, And so in fact, we're getting ready to do a crossover classical popular show that'll be filmed in August for PBS. Again, follow us and and you'll get to check it out. But uh, for me, I wanted to create an organization that was focused on audiences and connecting to community first, and then using the highest quality music to do that. Instead of saying, we have a product that you should come to hear and you should feel obligated to come and this is part of culture. But instead saying, what does our community need? What's going to open their hearts and minds and how can we serve that need? I absolutely love that. absolutely love that. And obviously in the name of what American Pop Orchestra, we also mentioned before that you've wanted to kind of reimagine classic American songs. But if you go back to the beginning, what was the very first piece that you actually worked on? Do you remember at all? What was the first piece that you worked on? Or that kind of actually our very sure our very first concert with the orchestra was a celebration of the women of the Rat Pack era. You know, Mm -hmm. so often you hear concerts with Sinatra and Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. and, and of course they're incredible. 
but you're not hearing as many concerts that put together singers like Eartha Kitt and Rosemary Clooney and Sarah Vaughan and even Ella Fitzgerald leans into that community. I mean, there's there's a Peggy Lee and Doris Day and just keep going through. And so that was the music we worked on in that show. And it was it was so much fun to give those women a bigger voice. I mean, I can count on one hand the amount of those types of concerts versus the amount of Frank Sinatra concerts. And by the way, I love Sinatra and there are many great albums yeah. and he was a great artist, but there are other voices that were singing and prolific at that time too. So that's what we did. Okay. Again, from right from the start, <laughs> flipping it on its head a little bit. I love that. I mean, how difficult is it for you to kind of flip it and change them up a, a little bit from the, the classic tracks and, and genres yeah. and flip them into something different? How difficult is that for you to do? Or is it difficult in the first place? Oh, it's not difficult for me. It's something that I listen to such a broad variety of music. I mean, I, I will say I think about it constantly. And my ears, because I grew up listening to so many kinds of music, and to this day, I listen to so many kinds of music. Uh, it's easy for me to hear different singers taking on pieces of music or perhaps a slightly different version of something. Mm. It just all blends together in my mind. I bet. And do you have any particular songs and themes that you've worked on over the years? Oh, I've worked on, I mean, everything from the music of Bach to, you know, working with Luis Fonsi. Mm. So I've done, I've done that whole gamut and kind of actively work on that. So for me, I have a few favorite, like one singer that I think is drastically underappreciated. Her name is Kay Starr, mm. an American singer who put out so many albums, an incredible artist, an incredible interpreter of song and her, the way she could reimagine a piece and the breadth of repertoire she covered. And by the way, she was Patsy Cline, the great country singer's favorite singer. So that's really the only connection many people have to Kay at this point. But I adore Kay Starr. I'm a big advocate of her versions of things and people getting to know her. That's absolutely amazing. And to work with such a broad array of artists must be the most amazing feeling, wouldn't it? Working with such amazing people, you have such, such amazing experiences. I mean, what have been some of your personal highlights over the years of who you work with, or the events you've been to? What have been some of your personal highlights? I would think um, Cheetah Rivera is one of my favorite people to work with. Um, Judy Collins, the great Judy Collins, is one of mm -hmm. my very favorite artists to work with. Talk about an interpreter of song at the highest level. Renee Fleming is always a joy, the way she can take any piece of music and make it feel so vital just immediately. I mean, I could go on Jean Thibaudet, I adore Midori, I adore Paolo Schott. Um, I mean, again, it just goes, Josh Groban is incredible. Kelly O'Hara is incredible. It just, it's Arturo Sandoval was wonderful to work with, Ricardo Morales. I, I love country music. I just was working um, with a bunch of country singers, which I had a lot of fun with. I don't know. The great thing for me is that I don't really ask a singer unless I love their voice and love their artistry to work with us. <laughs> so I get the, I have the pleasure of picking people that I've dreamt of working with and saying, hey, would you like to come try something different? And what's been wonderful is over the years, these legends, these icons, these people that are that are the top of their game have so often been so excited to get to do something different. Because most of the time, if you go to any of these names on YouTube, you're going to find the same three, four or five songs that they've done over and over and over and over across the world. Mm -hmm. And how it refreshing for them to get the chance to do something different. And that's been the great connective tissue between me and so many of these artists is giving them a chance to do something different. Of course. I mean, it must be such a surreal feeling working with such amazing, amazing, amazing stars. Totally. It's, yeah. I can tell you, I pinch myself every time I get to work with any of the people on that list. So. Mm, I bet, I bet. And you probably deserve it as well, because the work you do is unbelievable, honestly. Thank you. Pleasure. And have they given you any kind of amazing tips over the years of how you've, how you've put your music in a different way, maybe, over the years? <laughs> One of the things I would say I've learned, you know, Cheetah Rivera once said, do the homework and wear your own shoes. Mm. And so it's one of these things where know that your preparation is essential and that you're practicing and studying your music and getting to know the vocabulary of the different styles of music. And then simultaneously, once you get on the podium or at the piano to do it your way, to be true to who you are and make sure it's, it's your unique voice. Because I think all too often, so many artists set themselves up to try to mimic someone or they they want to they want to follow the exact career path or the style and and honestly so much of our training and the way we're trained in conservatories and universities is to 
following a very clear path that's been set out for generations and generations. Mm -hmm. But what I would say about every single one of these artists I just mentioned is every single one of them have their own distinct voice. They did the homework to study the great traditions and foundations, which is essential. But then once they felt comfortable with that, they felt safe and comfortable to, to put their own voice at the forefront. And that's what I've learned from watching all of them is, is honing and crafting your own voice, your own language, and staying true to that. Don't let others try to get you off course to mimic someone else or pigeonhole you into something. Stay true to who you are. I absolutely love that. That is, I love those words. It's so, it's so inspiring to hear the kind of words. And, you know, kind of talking about education and training and so forth as well. I, I heard you, you had um, lessons with Dr. Christine Keverston when you were younger. Yes. She yeah. was my piano professor at West Virginia University, who I loved. She since then passed away, unfortunately. But I really, she changed my life as a musician. I bet. I'm so sorry to hear that, though, of her passing. And I, can, and I know that certain people in your life are really pivotal in your lives, aren't they? And you, know, you mentioned that she was one of those people in your lives that really helped Absolutely. kind of mold who you are today. Um. I mean, who else in your journey so far has helped inspire you to become who you've, who you've become today? My conducting teacher in Ohio, Peter Georgisian, was a great influence. I got to work with the great Marvin Hamlish, who was a great influence. Um, Maureen McKay, my opera coaching teacher, was wonderful. My voice teachers, Patricia Pease and Martha Randall, were great influences on my career. So I've, I've been lucky to study with a lot of great people who care very deeply about sharing what they love and being an open book of resources and information to help me advance what I wanted to do and, and learn more and dig deeper. And then honestly, the best education I would say is working alongside all these artists who teach me every day how they do what they do at a high level and how they challenge themselves and never getting comfortable. Mm. I think that's another secret that I've learned from all of these 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 people is they always have a quest to get more knowledge hone their craft more exactly i couldn't agree more and i know that you got a master's in conducting from ohio university yeah how, how was that whole how was that whole experience you going to university and getting your master's from there oh i loved it i had a great time working with all sorts of instrumental and vocal groups and had a lot of time getting to hone my craft you know one of the things about going to a school that's not as a big name in the industry of music schools is that you get a lot of time to actually do what you do. I had more hours on the podium every week than many large conservatories give their students and students in front of large audiences and ensembles in a semester. And so I was able to learn what worked and learn what didn't with all levels of ensembles. And that was a great joy of going there. I bet. Can I know that you said that you grew up in Parkersburg in West Virginia? Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how how was life for you there when growing up? I had wonderful public school teachers in music, and that really is what got me interested in doing what I do. That also is what fuels my commitment to going back and doing free touring in rural Appalachian areas specifically, is that I knew if it weren't for my teachers and folks coming into my school at that time, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be where I am today. And so I want to make sure that I'm able to create that opportunity for so many students to come. I really admire that. Honestly, I really admire that. And have you always had a lot uh, love for music growing up as well? Always. Yeah. Always. I uh, started piano lessons when I was about eight years old and always wanted to be in the school choir and in the school plays and played in the band. So it was always something I wanted to do and, and was really passionate about. I bet. And kind of like leading off from, the, from finishing school and university that you found that being a, a graduate, going into the real world is like a very scary experience. I mean, how did you, how did you find your feet once you finished university and had your graduation and so forth? How, how did you find your feet after that? Well, I'm a firm believer in creating opportunities if they're not there right in front of you. And so that's what I did. I reached out to so many people to ask if they needed help and I would volunteer to adjudicate or sit in a rehearsal and take notes. And it led to folks getting to know me and seeing what I was capable of and challenging me and pushing me to get better. And so I just kept trying to create those opportunities and build a network of people that cared and believed in what I believed in. And it was scary because there was no path for the The career I have right now is not the traditional conductor's path or the type of repertoire that most conductors conduct at such variety so frequently. So for me, it's always been about 
just keep going in what I believe and what I feel strongly about and going that way. And if the opportunity is not there, then create it for yourself. I absolutely love that, honestly. And talk about creating as well. I thought I ain't got too much time left on this comment stream. So if you had to carry on, I'll send you a new link. But I wanted to ask actually as well, when you first started the APO or American Pop Orchestra and then seeing an idea fully fleshed out and doing what you're doing today, what was that feeling like for you? It was wonderful. I mean, it's I it's something I think about every day. It's something I work on every day, seven days a week, 365 mm -hmm. days a year. Honestly, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what do we want to try next? What do we want to go to next? How do we want to develop? And so it's very rewarding, but it's also very, it's a, it's a very big responsibility mm -hmm. to think, how can we keep evolving? How can we keep growing and never getting comfortable, never allowing uh, any outside forces to force us into a box to follow a certain model or path that other orchestras go down? Because that's what makes APO successful is being our own unique version of what an orchestra is. Mm. So it's very rewarding, but also very demanding. I bet. I mean, is that the kind of advice you would give to other people who want to start their own orchestra, their own group, or become a part of an orchestra is, yes, it's hard work, but you need to be determined and hardworking to get there. Yes, and I will say, you know, I'm a great fan of the TV show Hacks with Jean Smart on HBO, and, and there's a line she says in there where she says it never gets easier, which I would say is true. When you have your own organization, it, it never gets easier if you're growing and if you're committed to growth. It's very, it does get easier if you if you build a model and you stay with that model and you make slight variations, but really it's about that model. But for people like me, it's it's a quest to always push yourself harder, to reach further, to go deeper. And if that is going to be, if that's who you are and what you believe, then it won't get easier. It'll get, it's very rewarding. And believe me, I get great joy out of doing it. But it's not going to be easy ever. But I think that's the best live lives is lives that are always stimulating in one way or another and challenging and, and, and encouraging you to grow and connect more deeply. I love that. And for me, is I always love to finish on a really positive note. And that's the perfect way to finish, actually. But I do have a couple more questions before we go, actually, is... yeah. Uh, you mentioned about you're also the co-founder of Nova, which, we, as we know, is, is French for no is how did that all, for those that might not know about it, what is Nova Productions and how did it all start? Oh, yes. So we started uh, Nouveau Productions. And the reason we picked the name Nouveau is because we wanted to do something new. And again, it's when you go to so many events in the arts or outside of the arts, it's very common to see, again, that cookie cutter boilerplate formulaic event in the same types of spaces with the same types of people, the same types of look, again, with slight variation. And uh, my husband and I realized that there was a tremendous market for people wanting to do something outside the mold. Mm. And so that's what we try to do is we try to take organizations that may have done things a certain way for many, many years and say, how do you want to reach new people? How do you want to try to raise more money? How do you want to engage new audiences? And so that's what we work on all the time is, is doing that. I absolutely love that. I love that so much. And how do you find kind of that work balance of the APL or new world at the same time? You must have so much on your plate at the moment. Oh, always. But yeah. what's wonderful <laughs> is then I have a great orchestra to help offer clients if they'd like to have music at their event or add music to an event that maybe never had it. And I can't tell you how many clients, it, again, those of us that love and are in music know how transformational it is and know how it can really change a conversation. But for many organizations that have never had live entertainment at an event, to add that element, we've never had a client add live entertainment and then take it back out. Usually yeah. when someone adds it in, then they want to keep expanding it and it, it just keeps growing, which is great. And it enables me to give my players more work and hire more singers and dancers and actors. And, and so it's been a great symbiotic relationship. I bet, I bet. And once again, that is the perfect way to finish the whole podcast for the deadline as well. But I just want to say how thankful I am for today. It's such an honor talking to you, sir. And it's really oh, a real pleasure. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And one more time, how can people find you online, both your, your socials, your work? How can they all find you online? Yes, you can find me at Luke Fraser Music, and it's F R A Z I E R Music or lukefrasermusic.com, or you can check out the orchestra at theamericanpops.org, 
or at the American Pops. It's very easy. We keep it straightforward. <laughs> it's straightforward the best way sometimes. Exactly. But, uh, but Luke, Mr. Fraser, thank you so much for today. It's been a real pleasure. And that is the end of the podcast. Take care, everyone. Later. Bye-bye.